carry out justice and love kindness, walking humbly with our God. For righteousness and justice are the foundations of His throne. All creation's groaning, but in Him we find our home. Made in the image of God. justice and love kindness walking humbly with our God you're the father of all nations and you cherish every heart help us Lord to serve you and reveal to us our part made in the image of God justice and love kindness walking humbly with our God help us to see what you see a God who loves equally neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave justice and love kindness walking humbly with our God made in the image of God created in his love to carry out justice and love kindness walking humbly with our God Well, okay. 
keep us day and night. We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong. said if I am lost he will come to me and he showed me on that cross he will come to me for the Lord is good and faithful he will keep us day can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. For the Lord is good and faithful. He will keep us day and night. We can always run to Trust in the Lord with all your heart And lean not on your own understanding In all your ways acknowledge Him And He will direct your path Trust in the Lord with all your heart And lean not on your own understanding In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Sing with me from the Book of Wisdom, Proverbs chapter 3. Come together and remember, come and sing with me. Trust the Lord, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Sing with me from the Book of Wisdom, Proverbs chapter 3. Come together and remember, come and sing with me. Trust the Lord, trust in the Lord with all your heart And lean not on your own understanding In all your ways acknowledge Him And He will direct your path Trust in the Lord with all your heart And lean not on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you uh, wherever you are joining uh, with us from. Um, it's really great to be together um, here as uh, Cornerstone Church. Uh, this morning, we're going to be um, continuing our series through James. And I want to begin um, just being aware that there's a lot of people um, around the world, um, throughout the UK, here in St. Andrews, and in our own community here at Cornerstone 
that are, are really struggling this week. And we're going to be praying for some of the particular issues as we go forward, um, as people are looking at another lockdown um, across Europe and in England, and um, as a number of people in our own congregation have uh, have the virus or are struggling um, in various ways, being isolated because of contact tracing um, and other people dealing with different effects from this, such as um, affecting their employment or their uh, ability of, of their kids to be with other people. This is a difficult time for a lot of people. And as we're coming together this morning, um, we want to be able to sort of bring that to God, to lament that fact, to cry out to him um, in sorrow over what's going on, um, but hoping that in the midst of that, um, we might receive from him hope. Um, and so I'm going to be, uh, in just a second, reading one of actually my favorite psalms, Psalms 102, and I'll be reading a few different selections of it so we can get the whole the whole bit of it. But one of the things that we're going to hopefully find this morning from this psalm and from James is that oftentimes the immediacy of, of our problems are the only thing that can fill our vision, that can make us feel like um, there, there's, 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 there's no way things can get better or there's, there's no hope. Uh, and, and one of the ways that scripture suggests that we can find hope in those situations is by actually considering eternity, having an eternal perspective, realizing that the problems that feel insurmountable um, are real and they are painful and they should fill us with sorrow. Um, but that we also have the ability to contemplate a God who is sovereign over that, um, who is leading us um, home and who gives us hope in the midst of these things. And that's what this psalm is is all about. It begins speaking incredibly honestly about the sorrows of life in a way that I think resonates with many of us very directly. He speaks about not being able to eat or not being able to sleep um, because of his worries and his fears and his anxiety. But he goes and he turns and he finds consolation. He finds hope through considering eternity and through considering a God who is good and who does not change. Um, it's kind of like um, a great landscape painting. Um, this is one, this is a famous uh, landscape painting by the Dutch painter, Peter Bruegel. Um, but in these paintings, oftentimes the human element is very small. The humans are just in a small corner of the screen and that's very deliberate. It puts human life in perspective. And behind these small figures consumed in their own concern, there is this huge, beautiful, bigger picture. And that's sort of like what God and his eternity is like. It puts our lives in perspective. It doesn't mean that our sorrows and our troubles aren't real, but it gives us hope that there's a God who is beyond it all and who is leading us um, towards hope and can give us consolation in the midst of this. So let me just read um, these different selections from this Psalm 102. And it moves us from lament and from sorrow towards praise and towards joy as we reflect upon God and his eternity. Hear my prayer, Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me. When I call, answer me quickly. For my days vanish like smoke. My bones burn like glowing embers. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. In my distress, I groan aloud and am reduced to skin and bones. I am like a desert owl, like an owl among the ruins. I lie awake, I have become like a bird alone on a roof. But you, Lord, sit enthroned forever. Your renown endures through all generations. You will arise and have compassion, for it is time to show favor. The appointed time has come. So let this be written for a future generation, a people not yet created. They may praise the Lord. The Lord looked down from his sanctuary on high. From heaven he viewed the earth. He heard the groans of the prisoners and released those condemned to die. So the name of the Lord will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. In the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them and they will be discarded. But you remain the same. Your years, have, your years will never end. The children of your servants will live in your presence. Their descendants will be established before you.
comfort stand, no legacy survived unless the Lord does build the house in vain. It's This morning we praise you as we've just sang or heard for the the struggle um, with sorrow and pain and loss uh, at the same time as this uh, unspeakable joy, um, joy that cannot be taken away. I think of the challenge of right now where in hopelessness we don't know when this all ends. We don't know what to look forward to. We don't even know the way out. Um, we don't know when redemption comes uh, against uh, this virus. But then, in a bigger way, we have this picture that this song paints so beautifully of a true reality, of a journey that we're on where hope always remains. And uh, Jesus, we want to thank you for the work you've done in our lives, the work you've done uh, across the world, and the work that you have, have done forever such that we can live with you forever. I pray that you'd help us this morning. 
with what is going on and you'd help us to be glad that we are your people once again and you'd help us also to be people who are drawing closer to you from wherever we're at however far away we feel we pray in jesus name amen Thanks for that, Xander. Well, let me just say again, if you weren't with us at the beginning, welcome, good morning. Um, it's really a delight to have you with us. And Xander's, uh, even the way that we've been singing and praying is is directing us towards our, our theme this morning of thinking about um, within the troubles, the difficulties, the challenges of life, um, how does having an eternal perspective, a vision of a God who never changes and who is an eternal and a vision of, of this world as not being the end and not being all there is, how does that make a difference for us in the here and now, um, in the struggles, the challenges which we face today? Uh, uh, we have just very few notices this morning. Um, we know there's still folks that are, that are new, um, that maybe um, are new to St. Andrews or that are new to our congregation. We'd love to welcome you. Um, after the service, we'll have a tea and coffee time on Zoom. We'd really love for you to join us so we can get to know you a little bit. And we'd love for you to get more involved. There's home groups that are still meeting uh, throughout the week, uh, home groups for all sorts of different people. And you'd be very welcome to join us for that. So if you'd like to find out more information, if you'd like to join our weekly email, which is how we find out about what's going on in the church, um, you can go on our website and fill out an online or a digital contact card. You can see where to find that on the website just next to me now. Um, and you can find out about all the other things going on in our church through that, including the evening in-person service, uh, which will take place this evening. Um, secondly, um, we are still uh, have financial needs as a church. And so I want to take just a minute to say something about, about that. Um, we've been really thankful and blessed uh, by the way that people have continued to give and to sacrifice uh, for the sake of the church. And so for the, the many of you that have been doing that, we just want to say, Thank you so much. Thank you for that part of your, your discipleship of Jesus, for, for being discipled in the way you think about your finances and money. And we don't have, uh, you know, it's not as if we're coming to you saying we're in desperate financial situations right now, but I think sometimes it's periodically good precisely in those times um, to remind ourselves of what giving is about. Um, we will often say, say, you know, give if you feel led. And, and the reason we say something like that is there's no obligation to give. If you're a visitor, if you just clicked onto this and you're watching this online, there's no one needs to pay to watch this. Um, that's not what giving is about at all. Um, but if you are a follower of Jesus, part of our discipleship is turning over every aspect of our life to God. We turn over the way we, we, we treat our work, our family, um, the way that we um, think about even recreation, um, all of our life, the way we treat about, think about our neighbors, uh, all of that is affected by our faith. And one of the things that is affected by our faith is the way we use money. And, and there's, there's a pattern in the Bible of setting aside a part of what you make for the work of God's work in the world, um, but particularly for the, the church that you're a part of. And so I want to really encourage those of you that are not doing that right now. The point isn't that we are in desperate situations. And again, what often happens is a few people do that and support the church. But what's been slightly, we know, difficult and hard about meeting online is a lot of people that usually just give by putting a couple pounds into um, the plate. That has stopped. And um, so I want to just really, I guess, challenge you, not because we're desperately um, are saying, oh, we so desperately need your money. Um, oftentimes those are very small amounts, but I think it's more about the spiritual principle of don't lose that part of your discipleship while we're in lockdown. We have these ways that people can be giving. And so whatever that is, even if that means it's a very, very small amount, whatever disposable income you have, I want to encourage you to be setting aside a part of that for God's work. Some of that might come to the local church. Some of that might come to uh, issues related to justice around the world or to other uh, organizations, whether they're Christian or not around the world. Um, but let me just encourage you uh, to be doing that if you're a follower of Christ. Let that be one of the many parts of your life that you turn over to him. So again, if you want to do that, you can see ways that you can give by taking a picture of that QR code um, or by going to our website and going to the giving page and learning about how you can set aside a, an automatic uh, donation that just sets aside a part of your income, whatever that looks like uh, every month. Um, but again, that's something that is a part of your own discipleship before God. There's no obligation or pressure to be doing that. Well, in just a second, we're going to go on with our service, but we have a whole new set of kids videos right now about what is a Christian. 
Um, I think this is the second week. The first one was absolutely brilliant. So families do different things here at Cornerstone. Some of them will go and they will send the kids off now to watch that video in a separate room. You can find them on YouTube. You can find them on our live stream page on our website. They're also sent out in that email. So if you're not signed up for that, uh, do do so. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, so if the kids are going to go do that, you can do that. Now, other families will watch this together or watch that together or do different things in different ways. But if the kids are going to go do their own thing, um, we'd send them off to do that now. And let me just pray for them. Father, we thank you for being a community of all ages. We thank you that, um, that you have blessed us with, um, with, 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 with children and that they demonstrate something to us so profound about the nature of faith, the total dependence that we all have upon you. So may we honor them and view them as treasured members of our own community. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, um, while they're doing that, uh, this week, we, as we said, we're kind of thinking about a, a little bit about the struggle that many people are facing right now. And so we have a little video that V actually made. And V made a video of future V, going back in time to talk to past V, to talk to past V before the pandemic happened and to have a little conversation. So let's watch this conversation now between future and past V. Hey man. Whoa, you and me. Yes, uh, I am you. Uh, well, you in about uh, 10 months. Whoa, that's so cool. So you can tell me all the great stuff that happens this year. Well... Wait, it's a bad year? I can't say much. Or else I'll, you know, break the space-time continuum or whatever the sci-fi people are saying. What, like, am I gonna get kicked out of my master's program? No, 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 that, that, that's not it. Well, that's good. Oh, man, I was really looking forward to this summer. You know, spending all this time just working on my dissertation in the libraries and the great coffee shops. All right, libraries, coffee shops. Those are nice places to do work in. Yeah, yeah, I know those places are nice. What you notice about me? I can't work at home. I have to get out, you know. Hmm, I think you might want to reconsider that. Huh. Why would I do that? Wait, wait a minute. What's going to happen? Um, never mind. Let's just move on. Can you remind me what you're planning to do for the year? Yeah, sure. I was looking forward to also uh, travel around Scotland during the summer with maybe some of my master's school work. Maybe we'll go to Europe as well. Oof. Oof? Wait, what do you mean, oof? I got a travel itinerary planned. It's gonna be great. Uh, well, yeah, sure. Um, wait, uh, where else are you planning to travel? Oh, right. I forgot. Oh, you know, this. Oh, you already went through it. Uh, in March, uh, gonna go to uh, New York to visit uh, my brother. Oh, no. Oh, no. What do you mean? Am I, am I gonna get mugged in New York? Uh, no, it's, it's more like the whole world is gonna be facing the same uh, enemy. Wait, 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 what? The, the, the same enemy? What do you mean, like Satan? What, what are you even talking about? What do you mean? Sorry, I, I really can't say more. Huh. Well, I mean, if it's as you say, uh, the, the whole world against the same enemy, uh, I suppose the whole world is more unified together, right? All this political polarization is just really, really tiring. Oh, uh, um, you don't even want to know, man. Huh. Okay, okay, uh, just, you know, stay calm, stay calm. I, I think... What I can tell you is just to, to uh, prepare well, uh, uh, buy a bunch of toilet paper, um, maybe think about any new hobbies that you could start doing, and oh, oh, right, invest in Zoom. Buy as much stock in Zoom as possible. Zoom? What is Zoom? Oh, right, you, you, don't, you don't know about that yet. Yeah, you're going to be spending a lot of time with, with Zoom. Well, I guess if it's something that I should buy stock in, that means everyone loves it, huh? Um, uh, not, not really. By the way, nice job with the hair. I've, I've never done that in my life. Can I, can I, can I touch it? 
Oh no no no! Don't 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 come near me! Don't don't touch me! That's that's just silly. Let me let me just feel it. No no I'm serious. Don't do it. Come on. Let me let me. Dude. Well, thanks for that, V. Um, I think we can all uh, appreciate, uh, as V said, the way that our life has not uh, ended up necessarily this year as we would have hoped or as we would have planned. Um, and so that, that was a kind of humorous take on that, but we want to talk about that and, and pray for that in a more serious vein now. So I'm going to invite Fiona, who's going to come and join me, and together we're going to lead us in our time of prayer. Hey, Fiona, how's it going? Hi, Jared. I'm doing okay. How are you? Good. Good to see you. So Fiona, you've been, uh, you know, working in healthcare during this time. And one of the things that we, we really want to be praying for and thinking about is people that are in healthcare. Um, so what has it been like and how can we be praying and supporting you guys? Um, yeah, so I, I think it's very different in different positions within the healthcare system. I'm fortunate to not be working directly with acutely ill people. So, um, but yeah, there has been a sense in which um there's an unusual amount of stress around and uh, there's a sense that that does keep building and I've been reflecting a little bit you know contemplating the first wave and comparing to how we felt about contemplating the first wave but you know the first wave and the sec second wave and, and I think this time around we're probably not quite as scared we are better prepared um but we're probably more fed up <laughs> and there is just that sense of like tempers can be a little afraid um, and it's just really having feeling for our patients especially our patients with long-term conditions for a long time now have been having to kind of rumble on with kind of more minor health concerns but are still very troublesome without the same kind of support they would normally have and just trying to figure out how to support people well through that is not being straightforward um, and so facing the possibility of that becoming tighter again is, is scary but you know what we've learned and and we've learned um, from the fact that God has provided and we are better prepared for what's going ahead um, and we are able to support each other. And, and I think that's not just the case in healthcare. I think that's the case in schools. Teachers have been going through an awful lot um, in supermarkets and all sorts of um, essential services. You know, it's, it's not been a it's been a very complicated year. There's been a lot of stress around that we are learning, we are innovating and God is providing um and yeah well absolutely let's let's pray yeah we also want to mention people like hannah who is in charge right now running everything behind the scenes who works at amazon as well um and where are we at amazon Did, we would not be doing well absolutely that, <laughs> be yeah, nowhere. that's the only hope on those days without waiting for the little postman to come um but, you know, there's, as, as Fiona said, there's loads of things going on right now. And we're not going to mention people by name because we haven't asked for permission to do that. But um, there's a lot number of people in the congregation that have the virus, both undergrads that have then had to isolate and all that that has been involved with that. Um, and families um, that then is having health impacts on them. There's people whose jobs have been affected or have lost their jobs um, in the last week. Um, Obviously, people have probably been watching what's going on in France, both in terms of the lockdown there and the terrorist attack. Um, so we want to be praying for our brothers and sisters um, there and for Laura, our missionary there, who's um, said this has been quite a time for her, even thinking about her own ministry and what that looks like going forward. So there's just a lot um, to be praying for this week. And um, perhaps we're reminded even that this is Remembrance Sunday and usually would be remembering sacrifices that had been made um, from people f fighting for the Commonwealth uh, around the world um, throughout the past century. And this looks so different from any other Remembrance Sunday uh, that we would have had as a church. Um, so yeah, I think we're just gonna pray together then now, right, Fiona? Yep. Great. Should I just start and you, you take over? Sure, great. Father, we think of all of the different um, things going on right now. We think of some of the undergrads that have been, that have had the virus or that have had to isolate and that have had such a abnormal year and what, what their expectations and their hopes, particularly for those that are freshers for what this, this academic year would have looked like have in so many ways not come to fruition. And we thank you and pray for 
for them. We thank you for the way that they've still um, cared for one another so well that you have been using them to, to point people to you and to be answering the questions of their friends who are wondering, who are asking big questions about life in the midst of this. We thank you for people like Fiona and the host of other people at Cornerstone that are serving in essential um, jobs, uh, whether that's in healthcare or in schools or in supermarkets or um, in companies like Amazon. We, we ask that they would have a sense of the importance of what they're doing, even in the midst of increasing frustration um, and, and even anger, uh, I know, fr from talking to people. Um, anger that they're experiencing towards them or temptations to turn on one another in these sorts of situations. And we pray for, for people's health, for their, um, for their livelihoods. Um, yeah, we just bring this, this variety of needs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, I thank you that um, you made our bodies. Lord, you know how they work better than we do. Lord, you know what we need. And Lord, even as we are facing the situation where it is so apparent that things are not the way they're supposed to be, our world is not the way it's supposed to be, our communities are not the way they're supposed to be, our governments are not the way they're supposed to be. And um, yeah, and we are having to deal with this virus and all its many consequences for the way that we live our lives and, and the threat over um, life and, and, and livelihoods, Lord. I, I, I praise you that that you know more about this than we know, Lord, that you know what we need and you are you are our great provider. And Lord, I do pray that you'd enable us to, to fix our eyes upon you and to live in this the moment, Lord, not being anxious about tomorrow, but today presenting what is um, making us anxious to you and receiving your peace. Um, and Lord, I do pray your peace over the healthcare system, over essential shops and deliveries, um, over our governments. Lord, I do pray for wise leadership through this time, that good judgments would be made. Um, the Lord, that people would find a sense of unity in the midst of trouble. Um, and Lord, that um, and Lord, I do pray for America in, in particular in this next week, Lord, that there would be a just outcome to election. Lord, there would be the ability for people to understand people who think differently from themselves, Lord, and there would um, be an ability to accept wh where things haven't gone your way um, and, and an ability to move forward together as a nation over there. Um, do pray for the situation in France, um, Lord, for safety and for understanding and the situation in Poland where there is a lot of disquiet and rancor. And um, Lord, I do ask that you would bring your people together You'd enable people to understand those who disagree with them better and be able to love their enemies well. Um, and um, Lord, I do ask that you give us patience, patience with ourselves, and patience with one another, Lord, and faith in you as we walk through these difficulties. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that, Fiona. We're now going to uh, turn it over to Fernanda, who's going to uh, read scripture for us. Hello, everybody. Uh, please join me in a prayer of illumination. Heavenly Father, let us come to your word today, open and unafraid. Let it cut into our hearts between joint and marrow and transform us deeply. Amen. The first reading for today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, starting in verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, 
and Moab shall be trampled down in his place, as straw is trampled down in a dunghill. And he will spread out his hand in the midst of it, as a swimmer spreads his hands out to swim. But the Lord will lay low his pompous pride together with the skill of his hand, and the high fortifications of his walls he will bring down, lay low and cast to the ground, to the dust. The second reading for today is from the book of James, chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 13. Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town, and spend a year there, and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time, and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. Uh, let me cut straight to the point, uh, the main point, and state it boldly up front this morning. Uh, James 4, 13 to 17 is a wake-up call. Everything we've said in the service this morning points towards that. This passage is a wake-up call to consider our own mortality, our lack of knowledge of the future, and then in considering those to allow them to turn us away from a life that's centered on ourselves, trusting and living for ourselves, and instead become people who trust God and then do good to others. That's a, a, a broad uh, summary and rather a wordy one. You could put it more simply like this. Life is short, you're going to die. So make sure that you're trusting in something you're not trusting in something fleeting and temporary. Instead, make sure you're trusting in something which is eternally worthwhile. This is a very topical message, I'm sure uh, you, you'll understand, and many of us will understand right now just how topical this is. England's about to enter a second um, mostly lockdown for a, a full month. And of course, whether it'll finish at the end of that month is unknown at this stage. It would seem more than likely that Scotland will do something similar. COVID really has confronted us all in quite an unprecedented way. It's challenged us all in an unprecedented way with one simple fact that we are not in control. One of the most fascinating aspects of all of this over these last number of months has been the levels of fear and anxiety that we have felt individually and uh, in our communities, and in fact, as a society. The fear and the anxiety of facing something that we are not able to control. It's interesting to reflect further and more widely on the fact that the last uh, number of decades, um, we've seen a societal shift as well. Our society has shifted towards trying to minimize risk wherever we encounter it. So we eat healthier than we've ever eaten. The roads are safer than they've ever been. Kids rarely play outside unsupervised or alone. We do risk assessments and so on and so on and so on. It's interesting though that we don't seem to feel any safer. In fact, quite the opposite. We seem to be more anxious, more fearful, more depressed than we've ever been before. And that's even before COVID comes along. And COVID comes along and confronts us then with something that we can't control and that we can't defeat. And the question seems to be, well, what should we do? How should we respond to this? Should we just carry on and muddle on through? Or is there something more to be said, something more to be discerned perhaps in a message to us all? And that really brings us to this passage today that's just been read by Fernanda. To be just very clear from the outset in this particular talk, this passage isn't saying something like, do this and COVID will go away. 
It's not saying that. It is saying that this experience of COVID exposes our fragility, exposes our mortality, and then encourages us to consider our fragility and mortality, and then allow them to shift us from an autonomous, autonomy, a word just meaning self-law, we're in charge of ourselves, we define ourselves by ourselves, and we are centered on ourselves. But shifting us from that, and instead moving us towards a trust in God that leads then to doing good or doing right to others. Um, this is a passage that's just been read, and, and I just want to, to read it again, actually, or read bits of it again. It starts off with this, today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What's your life? You're a mist, says James. Last week, uh, Jared was dealing with the passage just prior to this, which really exposes this idea of a life centered on self. And the way that our desires and our passions then express themselves, and this is true of all of us, whether we would call ourselves Christians or not, that we have passions and desires within us that, that long to get for me what I think I need to make my life work. Everything I want to get me happiness, to make me safe and secure. And James says in that previous passage that such desires that start with me and, and return and stay on me and seek, in a sense, to use others and use whatever's out there to get what I need, that this leads to what he calls quarrels and fights among you, these desires. Such living for self, in other words, James says, fractures our relationships and it destroys communities. That's how James sets up the following two passages. This one on considering our mortality and considering our fragility. And the next one next week, which Jenny's going to be speaking from, on our attitude towards wealth and riches and what we do with them. All shaped by this basic point that if life is centered on ourselves, ultimately it's destructive, self-destructive and destructive of community and of relationships. I wonder how many of us a year ago, and, and V's little bit of, of drama really exposes this wonderfully, uh, how many of us wish that a year ago someone had told us to invest all that we had in Zoom. But in November 2019, just a year ago, not very long, how many of us have plans for the coming year, for 2020? I wonder if there's even one single person listening to this just now, one single person who doesn't look back at 2020 thus far, and see multiple plans, expectations and hopes that have been dashed or we've been forced to change. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. James confronts us with this. What James is saying though is that that's not unique to COVID times. That's the way it always is. This is always the case that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and we cannot plan or, or scheme for it, to think otherwise, to think that somehow we can do everything to control the future and minimize risk is to delude ourselves. It's to center life on ourselves in a way that James tells us will fracture community and break relationships. And James wants us to wake up to that reality. And the cultural moment we're in right this moment, right this minute, forces us to wake up to that reality. So I just want to say a few words about this passage and then make some suggestions as to practically where we might go with it. The first thing is that, of course, it is really a wake up call. It's a call to listen to a message, a message that's always true, but especially true right now. He talks about in verses 13 and 14, planning and scheming for the future. You who say, well, we'll go here and we'll do this or we'll do that and we'll buy and we'll sell, we'll get rich. You know, these great plans that we have. And James says we're confronted in the face of that by the fact that we just don't know what's going to happen next. Furthermore, he goes on then to say, it's not just you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but your life, he says, is like a mist. It's there one minute and then it disappears the next, just like a vapor that disappears. 
It's rather dark, rather grim thought. I think it's actually a, a thought that's designed to do good in us, not just to make us feel depressed or downhearted. So the first thing he does is to take our schemes for the future and confront us with our lack of knowledge on the one hand and our mortality and our fragility on the other. The next thing he does in the passage then is to contrast on the one hand boasting in our arrogance and contrasting that with we should instead say if the Lord wills this or that then we'll do it. A contrast then between boasting in the self and on the other hand aligning ourselves with God's will recognizing that he's the one who's in charge and he's good. This boasting in arrogance the, the phrase that, that we saw there in the passage is uh, another way of describing this life centered on self, what I can do, what I've done, my life, my will, my pleasure. And it's contrasted with recognizing the Lord's will, that I'm not in charge, actually, and he is. It's important to say at this point that when we he see words written there in a passage like this that talk about boasting in arrogance, Maybe you've got someone in your mind when you think of words like that and somebody who's loud and, and boastful and always talking about themselves and so on. And sure, I think this category includes that kind of a person. But I think it's deeper than that, much more subtle than that. We could say, actually, that boasting and arrogance in the context of James's argument right here would be any refusal to consider God as being the one who's in charge. A refusal to allow God to be the one that's in charge and the one, therefore, uh, I trust and I put at the center of my thinking and my doing and my feeling. And in contrast, I have all kinds of subtle ways that I put myself in charge instead. And then James goes on to say that it's not just that uh, the contrast between boasting and aligning with God's will, but that that, having drawn out that contrast, he then points to a practical outworking of that, that to reject a life centered on self and instead to align with God's will is then what he calls knowing the good we should do and doing it, and implicitly doing it for others, not having our lives shaped around uh, schemes for our own advancement, whether that's our jobs or, or uh, career or family or relational plans or money or whatever it happens to be, but instead centered upon God's will, knowing the good that we should do and doing it to and for others. To summarize then just what this passage is saying really briefly, essentially the message is, is this, don't invest your hopes in anything that depends on yourself because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and your life is short and to do that is to have all your hopes all your life invested in something that is going to end instead of trusting then in a mist trust in something solid now this passage is not just a negative hey you're going to die so you better think about that and shape up um, it would be rather negative if it were just on its own. But in fact, if we read ahead a little bit through the next passage and into chapter five and verse seven, the key then is not just being aware of our fragility and our mortality, but it's also being told how the story ends, what actually happens next. So if we go ahead and we look at uh, James chapter five, and verse 7, where James then says, be patient then, or therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. And he talks about a farmer waiting for a crop um, and, and knowing that crop is on its way. You too be patient, stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. In other words, our hope and our trust is in one who is in charge and who is coming to restore and renew all things and that we are safe in the meantime in his hands in such a way that we can live differently now as a result of it. 
let me suggest some practical outworkings of all of this. This is about aligning ourselves then with God's will, trusting then, or it requires a trust that God is good and that his will is somehow what is best for us and not that which diminishes us. It's a challenge and a step of faith to believe that. And as Jared said earlier on, as we look at the circumstances around us, and it's sometimes hard to see beyond that, to see the reality of the bigger picture and the reality of knowing how the story finishes, how it all turns out, that the Lord's return and restoration. It was for good reason I had the, the Isaiah 25 passage read. Uh, a passage that's picked up again in Revelation 21, this picture of, if you like, the end of this story, the beginning of the next glorious chapter where God himself is with his people, restoring all things to the way that they should be, wiping tears from eyes, taking away all crying and sorrow and pain and death, and instead perfect fellowship with him and with one another forever. That's what those who have entrusted themselves to Jesus Christ, have to look forward to. To some practical suggestions. COVID certainly is a challenge. Actually, it's an affront. It's an affront to our modern sense of autonomy, that self-law, me at the centre, defining my life, making my plans, building my CV, doing the things that make me happy. Our current circumstances rudely expose our fragility and our mortality. Not that they weren't there before, it's just that they've now been exposed in a way that nobody can deny. And that's actually good for us. I'm not saying for one second that the virus is good, but it's a good thing. Absolutely not. Death and illness is a wicked intrusion upon a good creation. and It's not the way it's meant to be but we are exposed by it. It shows us we're not in control. This is not to say we don't then look for treatment or vaccine, but it is to say that we use it as the wake up call that James would have it be to us. Centering our life on ourselves is futile. It's self-destructive and it's opposing ourselves to God. And we've seen already in James that God opposes the proud that gives grace to the humble. We will all die. It's just a matter of timing. What then? That's the great question. And the great good news of Christian faith is that to entrust oneself to Jesus is to know that this is not all that there is. And there is a future coming that we can be confident, uh, we can be certain of, that Jesus will restore all things to be the way that they're meant to be. James points us towards that here. We wait upon the Lord's return and therefore we can be long-suffering or patient in the meantime. We can trust, depend and trust ourselves to him awaiting the Lord's return. We can invest and look forward to his welcome, his friendship, his restoration and his fellowship forever. We don't know what's happening tomorrow, but we do know how the story ends. And that can make a difference to the way that we live now. That means we can know the good that we ought to do to and for others and do it because we are safe, confident in Jesus' hands. It's a couple of points to finish. This really does relativize what we think is important. And it should actually diminish our worry I have a phrase that I've often used and various folks tease me about it, um, well, rather frequently, actually. Um, and it's when discussing or hearing news of some challenge or difficulty or setback. And I have been known to say, well, on the plus side, we're all going to be dead soon. And of course, that's black humour. It's not just black humour. It is black humour, but it's not just black humour. It's actually a sober recognition of what this passage is talking about. It's uh, a statement that we're not in charge. We're not in control. The Lord's returning. We can trust him 100%. And that this difficulty and this challenge, whatever it is, is temporary. And it will pass. And we look forward 
to being with the Lord forever, where there will be no tears, no more death or sorrow or pain. And that knowledge of the future relativizes how we might feel in the present. It doesn't mean things aren't hard when they're hard. It doesn't mean that we do not weep when things are the way that they're not supposed to be. But it relativizes it. It puts it into perspective, to put it another way. There's a second point here, and I'd love to say more about it, but I'm only going to mention it and then leave it just really in passing. That, that this idea that, in fact, what the Bible does over and over again for our good is to, uh, to take our autonomy, our self-rule, and to take us off the throne. It's not good for us to be there. And to put the good God on the throne of our lives instead. The demand in our culture and in each of our lives, the demand for autonomy. I will be in charge of myself. I will get the resources and money and relations and possessions that will make me be able to make my life do what I want it to do to make me happy. That demand for autonomy is something that God directly confronts. You're not autonomous. You are a creature. You need God. And if I can just say in passing then, that for example, the growing societal swelling demand for autonomy over the time and manner of our death would just be one example of exactly what a passage like this is pushing back against and saying, actually, that sort of demand for autonomy is what James says is boasting in arrogance. Let me give you a, a last point then. If you knew how the story was going to turn out, would you live differently now? It's a huge question, isn't it? As I was thinking about this, that led me to uh, films that were out when I was a, a university student. Some of you will recognize this as being um, Biff, the character from Back to the Future, whose future self comes back and gives him a sporting almanac with 50 years worth of sporting results for the future. And that allows him then to bet on all the results of these sporting events and make himself a vast fortune without any anxiety or worry because he knows the result. It's a kind of trivial example, isn't it? But the point is, if you know how things are going to turn out, it makes a difference to how you live right now. I've lost count of the number of times I'm watching something, a TV series perhaps, or a movie, and I'm anxious about a character I've become attached to. And I find myself quickly looking up Wikipedia to find out whether they die or not. And if they're okay, then I can watch the rest of the movie with less anxiety. You see the point that knowing how things turn out changes how we might live now. How should we now live? How it turns out means that we can know what's good and do it now because we're taken care of. This actually diminishes our anxiety and our fear. Imagine knowing how things are going to turn out, living fearlessly then in the present for God, knowing that the end of the story is sure and certain, but knowing that death is not the end of the story knowing that we have nothing to fear. If death is the worst that can happen, and then we are safely entrusted into the Lord's hands, then we really can live lives that are radically about doing good to and for others, rejecting self-trust and rejecting self-interest, and instead saying, I am taken care of, provided with everything I need now and for the future. There is nothing in this universe that can separate me, separate me from the love of Christ. From being with him in close relationship with him forever. Ultimately in a restored and renewed creation with my tears wiped away. In perfect fellowship and friendship with him and with others. And if that's how it turns out then I don't need to be anxious about defending myself now. I don't need to use others in relationships to get what I think I want. My whole life can be radically reorientated from me first to loving God and receiving his love and then giving it to others. And that is radically good news. It's transformatively good news. And this is what James is getting at. 
Stop worrying about the present, he's saying. Stop making your plans and your schemes. Stop building your CV and devoting so much of your time and your energy to things that ultimately don't matter and can't do you good. Here is Jesus, the Lord, the one who truly is in charge, longing to do you good. If you'll only let go the tight grip you have on all the things that you're holding on to for meaning and significance and purpose and security, let them go because they're trinkets. And instead, open your hands to receive what he would give you instead. And then those things that you have been holding on to so tightly become actually truly valuable in their right context. This is wonderful, wonderful good news. On the positive side, as we look at everything that's happened, we're all going to be dead soon. And that's true in the grand scheme of things. But it's not the end of the story. As Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And James is picking up exactly this theme about the purpose and the meaning of life. Life not centered on self, but life centered on the good God who gives us all we need for now and forever. Let me pray for us all as I close. Our Father, I thank you. Even as I was speaking just now and the sun has come out over St Andrews, we thank you that whatever afflictions and trials, and they are many and they're real and they're painful, they are temporary. Lord, for those of us who are listening who have not entrusted ourselves to Jesus Christ, Lord, I do pray today as they see the Lord of the universe with open arms beckoning and welcoming and saying, here you can find home and security and safety now and forever. Lord, I pray for anyone listening that they would run towards those welcoming arms and say, here I am, take my life and be in charge of it. But for all of us, it's the same message, Lord, and I pray that you would show us today the ways in which we are clinging desperately to autonomy, trusting in ourselves, and that you would mercifully release us from those things as we consider our fragility and our mortality, and that we would not trust in a mist, but we would know the true everlasting joy of trusting in you. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. upon 
Your perfect love has covered me And what can this heart know? And what can this heart tell? But of grace that has rescued me O oh, perfect love my prayer shall ever be to be found in Jesus. Oh, perfect love, forever I shall sing of heaven. Gates flung wide for me, where fear of death and tears of hopelessness are swallowed up in victory. And what praise shall be sung still to the Holy One, to the Savior redeemed. And King, O oh, perfect love, my song shall ever be. I am found in Jesus. Oh, what praise can be sung still to the Holy One, to the Savior redeemed. And King O oh, perfect love My song shall ever be I am found in Jesus Our Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Saviour. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Church and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe i
I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe. Lord, thank you for this hope and this future with you. I thank you for the words of that creed um, put together long ago by people seeking to follow you and to defend the faith from waywardness and wrong turns. Lord, help us to do the same so that we may be truly putting our hope in something certain, something sure, but more importantly, something true, our hope in you, your truth of life everlasting. Uh, Lord, help us to be free from the fear that comes as a result of trying to look after ourselves, of trying to make everything under our control. I pray that you'd help us to honor the government. You'd help us to honor those that we live around. You'd help us to love and protect and to serve. But ultimately, may this be done by a renewed heart and spirit within us, um, supernaturally done by you. Help us to play our part to join in and Lord thank you for this amazing hope we have uh, with you that will never spoil or frayed and can never be taken away we pray in Jesus name amen quite enjoyable time there for everyone paper falling off I've got the lads shouting in the background playing Lego Star Wars so I think we're over to Jared for our benediction hand was that Xander whose hands was magic was that the hand of God the hand of God come in and and fix the things for you. Wow, that was amazing. Um, Well, thanks so much for for being with us. Uh, Let me send us out with this blessing. O good shepherd, seek me out and bring me home to thy fold again. Dear, deal favorably with me according to thy good pleasure till I may dwell in thy house all the days of my life and praise you forever and ever. Amen. Thanks again so much for uh, being with us. And um, let me again just invite you to join us uh, on Zoom in just the next five minutes for a really brief tea and coffee time. Whether you've been with us for a while or you're you're new to to, uh, Cornerstone, we'd love to just spend some time really briefly chatting with one another. Thanks for joining us. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever, so by the grace of God we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. 
forever God is with us forever forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever forever so give thanks to the Lord our God and King his love endures forever for he is good he's above all things his love endures forever sing praise sing praise for his love endures forever